regulations. But we see clients that could, literally can't answer those questions because they can't collect the data. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's bad. It's going to be difficult for you to connect to business value and, and to be seen as a value contributor. One of the key things that we do as testers, which is find bugs that need to be fixed before we, before we ship, and thereby provide the company with an opportunity to save, in many cases, a lot of money, huge amounts of money. If we can't measure that, then um, you know, we, we basically kind of uh, uh, obscured one of our main marketing points. And uh, you know, really, you, you want to avoid doing that because you do need to market testing. <laughs> Excuse me. Now, um, so what is the return on the testing investment? So, for for some of our clients where we could calculate their team's return on investment, is part of the assessment process. So, in the industrial control system I was talking about before, one thousand four hundred seventy-five percent. So you know, 15 times. In other words, a company was saving 15 times what it was spending on testing based on the, the defects that were being found uh, by the test team. And that's just based on the defects being found. There are other things that we could try to quantify. Uh, banking application. This is the, the successful banking testing team I was talking about before. 3,500%. In other words, for every dollar spent, they save thirty-five dollars on that. Now that you say, well, yeah, that would make sense, banking, because you know it's high risk. And yeah, that's absolutely true. When you start talking about things that are high risk, the cost of external failure is extremely high. That does indeed magnify the return on the testing investment. But so what? I mean, that's just an, an, an argument that the more expensive it is to have bugs in the field, the more we should spend on testing before, which I think is is completely intuitive and should be intuitive to just about anybody that you, you mention that to. But it is good to be able to measure it. Now, consumer electronics product, we measured that's 333%. Uh, so basically, every dollar spent saves three. And that's kind of at the low end. But still, you notice, I mean, that's a spectacular return on investment. Spectacular. Nobody's getting anything like that in the stock market. You know, I mean, even even the uh, Madoff investors who, you know, um, what, you hear people arguing on TV, well, they should have known that it was too good to be true. I mean, even the Madoff investors would have said, no, 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 that just can't be. But, you know, this is by well-established uh, techniques of uh, cost of quality analysis that say, yep, this is this is what happens. It's, it's very expensive to have bugs in the field. Internet appliance project that we worked on, 866 percent. So this is this is not not at all uh, unusual. Uh, a guy named David Rico did a study for the U.S. Department of Defense where he found that the average return on the testing investment was about 800 percent. So it's it's not just me. Uh, now, if you're wondering, hey, how exactly do these calculations work? And maybe I've got the data that I could do this. If you go out to the basic library page of the website rbcs-us.com and take a look at the article in the basic library, it's completely free, like everything on the basic library, and um, you uh, download that article, Testing ROI, What IT Managers Should Know. It'll uh, walk you through a case study of exactly how to, how to quantify this. Not terribly difficult. OK, now, let's go back. I raised a question earlier. Based on financial considerations, when should testing conclude? And as I said, there is a. Uh, there is an answer to this, and if you do the cost quality analysis that's shown in that article that I mentioned, you will you will be able to do this. Um, basically, what you have to do, and this is just you know e economics 101 for those of you who took economics in, in college, um, you, you've got the marginal cost of finding a bug in test, which is the cost taking into account all the factors that that apply of continuing testing until another bug is found. Now, the marginal cost of testing is going to go up as the cumulative defects found curve levels off, uh, assuming a constant uh, amount of test effort, right? So you know you can think of it as kind of being that curve sort of in reverse. And so when the bug find rate is low per hour of testing, the marginal cost of a bug in testing is high. The bug found rate, bug find rate is high in testing. The marginal cost of finding a bug in, in testing is is low. Now. So then we have to say, OK, well, what is the average cost of a bug in production? 
And the way to look at that would just be, well, what's the total cost of external failure divided by the number of bugs which were found in production? And that's part of that cost of quality calculation. And from a purely economics perspective, what an economist would say is when the marginal cost of a bug in testing, the cost to find the next bug, is it reaches the point where it is equal to the average cost of a bug in production, then testing should conclude. Now, this is an entirely financial slash economic analysis. This does not take into account any moral, ethical, legal, or other considerations that might apply to your application. So for God's sake, if you are testing safety critical applications, please don't use this as your exit criterion. Oh, well, you know, we've, we've you know, hit the economic uh, saturation point of you know, testing, so we're done. I mean, if, if you get software that can go out there and kill people, then, then obviously using, using this as one of your exit criteria is, uh, I, mean, I think the only, the only word really is unconscionable. Uh, but if you're, if you're in other kinds of non-safety critical lines of work, where really it's, it does all come down to money, um, then you know certainly I would say that this should be one of the things that you look at. It does not make sense to continue to test to the point where finding bugs costs more than it would to just live with them in production or deal with them in production. In fact, you're, you're actually, of course, you're paying twice, right? You're paying once for the money and once for the lost schedule time. So this is something that, that I think people should be able to answer, but unfortunately a lot of people can't. But, but now you can. Now you know how to do it. Oops. Okay, now there was another question that I brought up earlier, and you know, I, I said there's you know, four, four possible reasons, and, and some of you might have jotted down a few of those. Now you can check your list against mine here. So why do we need more information than just is shown on that open-close chart? Why, why is that, that, that chart with the, the red line and the green line not enough? Well, um, you don't know if the test effort was constant over time. So you don't actually know if the leveling off of the cumulative number of bugs reported, the red line on the top of that chart, if that um, is happening because testers are continuing to work but there are no further bugs to find, or if the testers uh, have been redeployed to other things, or they have been blocked, or, or what have you. Um, you don't know if all the planned tests were run. So it could be that we got done finding bugs, but we had omitted some key uh, tests, and so there's some holes in terms of, of our test plan. Um, and if there isn't a good reason for that, then, you know, this, is, this is not a good situation. You don't know what risks were addressed and what risks weren't addressed. So you are not able, based on a simple um, open-closed chart or found-fixed chart or reported resolved chart, whatever you call that convergence curve that I showed you earlier, you, just based on that, you do not know what risks were addressed and what risks were not. And so you don't know what your residual level of risk is. Similarly, you don't know what requirements and design specification elements were covered. So you don't know what level of competence you should have in the system. And also, in, some, in a lot of cases, resolved is not only those bugs that were fixed and confirmed as fixed, but they can also, that resolve curve uh, will, will often also include a deferral. And if the deferral rate has been extremely high, then really all we've done is sort of shunt this problem over into the field. Uh, so this is, is why we look for what, what I ref, I'm referring to here on this slide as a balanced, balanced testing scorecard. Uh,